have you given some thought to the trees around you? They seem to be constant giants purifying our air and beautifying our landscape. I recall a giant camel foot tree in my garden when I was growing up. We fashioned a swing to it, and my friends would come by, and we would enjoy time on that giant tree. We had a drought in South Africa, and very soon after, that tree began to droop, lose vigor, fall, and die. We see these effects of climate change becoming more apparent, and in Africa, the situation is even more concerning, as most of Africa is water scarce. Over the next 80 years, we expect a reduction in rainfall up to 30 percent. This will affect northern and southern Africa. This will happen over natural forests like the beautiful aloes in Namibia, the acacia trees in the Kruger National Park, and the tropical rainforests. Not only is it going to be drier, it's going to be hotter too. By the end of the 21st century, we are expecting a four degrees Celsius increase in temperatures. What does this mean for crops? Well, with every one degree increase in temperature, we expect a three to five percent drop in yield for crops. As human beings, we are intimately reliant on plants for our very existence. Not only do they supply us with food, with fuel, with building material, but medicines too. Aspirin, for example, is derived from the bark of the willow tree. Similarly, there is massive untapped potential in plant species around the world for medicinal value. Now, let's talk about chocolate. We expect that by 2050, it may become impossible to grow cocoa plants in the humid areas that's needed. A future without chocolate. What we need is plant resilience. We need plants that can withstand the effects of climate change. Additionally, plants are also subject to challenges with pests and pathogens. And you can imagine. That when you have warmer weather, you have more conducive environments for pathogen infection, or you could have increased life cycles for pests. So, what would a world look like without plant resilience? In first world countries, our survival would be threatened somewhat. The cost of food would triple. Uh, we may have to forego our morning cup of coffee, and let's just be honest: a world without chocolate would be simply boring. The situation in developing countries is even more worrying, and that is because most of these developing populations require staple food, and that's going to come from one or two types of crops. With these overwhelming odds. We need to embrace technologies that are developing rapidly. If we think about it, the world population grows at 7.5 billion today, and it's expected to be 9 billion by 2050. We have to increase our food supply by 70 percent to meet this world demand. In recent years, we've been adopting. Plant biotechnology advances, plant genome sequencing, DNA marker technology, and genetic modification. Since the year 2000, scientists have been sequencing the plant genomes from model plants that have simple genomes to the more complex crops, such as wheat and sugarcane. Scientists can now tell. Which genes may be better adapted for certain conditions like drought stress, pest resistance, etc.? Over and above the genome, researchers are looking at whether a gene is activated. So, if a gene is activated under a particular challenge, for example, drought stress, we understand 
that it is making more proteins that are important for plant resilience. The next biotechnology tool is the use of DNA marker technology. With this technology, regions of the genome carrying some desirable properties are tagged and followed in plant breeding programs. Scientists are marrying both genome sequencing technology together with DNA marker technology and have come up with genomic selection. In this technique, associations are made for genomic regions and desirable properties such as drought resistance, pest resistance, increased yield. Predictive models are made, and through an iterative process, if we had to look at the DNA itself, we can tell whether the plant is going to be more resilient. We have a better chance of producing a genetically superior crop. The third tool is CRISPR technology. With this type of genome editing technology, we can make very precise changes to the plant genome. In some cases, we may want to remove the effect of a susceptibility gene. Some examples that already exist where we have CRISPR-edited crops close on our way are bacterial blight resistance in maize. We have virus resistance in cucumber. And we also have other fungal resistance that's coming up for wheat. Genetic modification is a topic fraught with controversy. The worry is that it is foreign, it is unnatural, and thus unsafe. But as human beings, we have been doing genetic modification for hundreds of years. Wheat, for example, is a hybrid between different grass species. We've been using chemical, or chemical mutagenesis or radiation, and we've applied that to seeds. We've been making large and oftentimes unknown changes to plant genomes. What is really interesting is that genetic modification relies on a certain type of bacterium to introduce DNA fragments into the plant genome. It was fascinating to learn very recently that sweet potato, the sweet potato that you feed to your baby, contains the same DNA fragments and it's transferred by the same bacterium. But it is done by Mother Nature and not at all by scientists. We hear a lot of bad press about genetic modification. But what we don't hear often are the positive impacts in its very short history, genetically modified maize has resulted in a decrease in the use of pesticides by up to 37 percent, an increase in crop yield by 22 percent, and an increase in farming by 37 percent. Genetic modification is a biotechnology tool that can benefit the poor and food insecure. But alas, it is not accessible to them because of regulations that stem from fear and misconceptions. In my own work, I am looking at the complex defense network of forest trees. Why forest trees? These trees are long living organisms. They have to bear the onslaught of pests and pathogens and the effects of climate change during their lifetime they must possess some remarkable resilient mechanisms. In my work, I am looking at this particular insect pest. It is only one or two millimeters big, but this little wasp lays her eggs on young eucalyptus leaves, and these galls develop. These galls are somewhat like tumors or a wart in animals. But the plant becomes so burdened with these galls that it ends up being stunted and more like a shrub than a tall eucalyptus tree. So my team has been looking at genomic regions 
that are associated with resistance. Using those markers, we can now select for resistance. And if we plant those resistance trees, we can now decrease the devastation caused by this insect pest. Pine species are amongst the world's most largely grown. And unfortunately, they're also subject to some kind of attack by pathogens. I am looking at a resistant pine species and a susceptible pine species, and I'm looking at the sets of genes that are activated. What was fascinating was to see that the resistant pine species was responding, whereas the susceptible pine species was not. At the molecular level, we were also able to see where the sly fungus is able to suppress plant defenses along the network. So if we can now prevent the suppression by the fungus, we can produce more resilient pine species. We continue to explore CRISPR-Cas technology to investigate what the functions are of various plant defense genes. And we hope to make a step change to producing resistant trees against some major pests and pathogens. I believe that we cannot ignore the role of plant biotechnology in producing plant resilience. As a mother of three children, my wish for them is to live in a world where they have enough maize for their breakfast. They have enough sweet potatoes, just about the right amount of chocolates, and of course, a giant camel foot tree to swing from. We need to be adopting the best biotechnology strategies to make our plants stronger. And we need them stronger so that we can survive. Thank you.